Well, um, welcome to today's Altula Community Advisory Group um, meeting. And uh, I'll share the screen here. Um, I'm going to just ask for, for folks on, online to help um, keep an eye out for um, anyone that has a hand raised or, or that's joining that's waiting to, to be let into the meeting. That would be a big, big help. Um, all right, so our uh, our agenda today. Find, where's the mouse? Uh, Bob, if you could, uh, if you want to mind, just uh, look at the bubble there. Um, the <laughs> I took it there because I couldn't see the screen from here, so I had to get closer to see it. And uh, if there's a way to um, make what we're seeing here on the screen kind of bigger for everybody in the room. That'd be great too. Yeah, you can do just the pop out. Cool. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. So our, our agenda today is we, we want to give you a project overview, project update, um, and, uh, and just to sum up, you know, where we've been and where we're, where we're going. Um, and then we want to spend most of our time here on, um, on scenarios, um, our scenarios approach and uh, and sorry, my computer is beeping. Not really. I have to go back. Yeah, it's got a bit. Sorry, technical difficulties. All right, hold tight, everyone. Little glitch. We're gonna fix this and then roll again. I should stop recording and starting. Could you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not. Let me present a team. So I need to see the next here. Um, this one. It's so. Uh, yeah. If could you mind um, bringing that up and, and presenting? Um, and I'll I'll be able to see what I'm actually saying here. Okay. Sorry about this, everybody. Um, and I'm not sure why that's still not. It's just um, I've stopped on my hand. I think maybe you just X out the yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're while well, we're getting set up, just to run through it, we're gonna um, we want to um, yeah spend most of our time here to catch you up on on our approach to the scenarios um, and uh, and then talk through and catch you up on on where with the future place types um, work. Um, and so, you know, we, we want to provide you with context and awareness of what um, these are and how we're thinking about them so that as we dive deeper um, into them moving forward with this with this group, um, we have a solid foundation of understanding to build on. Um, so as we talk through these today, um, you know, we don't have specific questions um, that we've uh, developed to point you towards, but we, we do want to hear from you if you have, you know, if there are things that catch your attention, um, that cause any concern, um, and uh, and then, you know, we want to, you know, continue to get a sense of how might the groups and communities that um, you're engaged with respond to uh, respond to these. I'm trying. 
It says I'm sharing my screen. On my computer. Can the people online see it? Yeah, can we do a test online and can, is, can anyone hear us? And if you can, can you see the presentation that we're sharing? We can yeah. hear you. Yes, we, 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 can. See the, we see the presentation in like working mode, so it's not in full screen. If that helps oh. you identify okay. what we're seeing. Yeah, we just our screen is black. Oh. Mm. Are you sharing your teams? What if you minimize that window right there? Is there another window behind this one? Oh, good. Seems to be stuck. <laughs> the only thing I've gotten to solve it when it gets this stuck is unfortunately to end the meeting. Okay. All right, folks, we're going to um, do a quick reset here. Apologies. And um, we're going to close the meeting and start it back up again. Um, and uh, we'll rejoin you here shortly, we hope. We can stay, I think. You, I think you can stay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll exit and come back in. Okay. I don't even know how you it works. Oh. Seemed like it worked. We're, we're all still here, so hopefully. <laughs> Hope it works for them. I know. <laughs> the council will start like 45 minutes late. Like, yeah. oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> the council broke it. I know. <laughs> 3 a.m. They were on it. Yeah. It broke me too. <laughs> I, I, I tapped out about midnight, so. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi, we're back. Um, let's try, let's try this. Um, do you have the presentation open on your computer, Mark? Can I use your computer too? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Great. Mark, you just run us through. Yeah. All right, oh, yeah. Sorry. Let's go. All right, this is really close. I feel like I have a man. Um, okay, so um, let's. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we get to this, um, just to, to um, stay on track here, um, we have time for, for public comment. Um, so before we move on to um, items uh, on the agenda, this is a chance for anyone um, from the, the public. Um, not related to the agenda items to, to bring any, anything up. Um, see a hand raised, David, go go ahead. Are you able to unmute yourself? All right, so am I unmuted? Yep. All right, um, so yeah, I appreciate everyone meeting here and I appreciate what you're trying to do for our city. Um, so I've brought up some things to zoning, but I'd like to bring it up to the board specifically. Um, I typed this out, so hopefully it works. I haven't. This is my first run through it. So, uh, are you looking at the side of my head or my front of my head? I have a screen I'm reading from, and, which is <laughs> different. We see you head on. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so uh, the city's design standards currently have caused inequity due to building form requirements of the current zoning code. Multifamily projects have had tens of thousands of dollars of cost construction costs added, and thereby raising the rents uh, of the renters to pay for that cost. <clears throat> those higher rents are causing harm to working citizens in our fair city and exclude those that cannot afford the higher rents. Additionally, the amount of pollution and carbon footprint load added to our environment has skyrocketed due to city's form and glazing requirements. I have designed a mixed use building and the design excellence overlay, which has allowed the data to be collected to prove the negative impacts of form and design requirements of city policy. The residential units affected most by forming glazing rules have a utility cost of 190% more than the units that do not have those same zoning requirements. The base fees for the utility are the same, so the additional cost is an additional electricity created by burning coal and natural gas to meet the higher electrical demands due to the city's zoning requirements. I encourage the board to stop the city from further economic and environmental degradation through additional form and design based regulation. And I will leave it at that because you have a busy meeting. And I appreciate the time to speak to you. Thanks, David. Appreciate that um, consideration as well. 
Uh, are there any other public comment for for today? Okay, it's not seeing any. We'll we'll move on to our um, first uh, business item here. Um, we want to spend a minute or two providing uh, an update and a reminder of where we've been uh, with work related to this project and then provide you with an indication of where we're headed over the next few months. So uh, related to, to where we've we've been uh, recently um, in the spring and summer um, uh, specifically, um, I'm going to break this out between work related to code reform and work related to the growth policy uh, update um, on the code reform and uh, we released the, the code diagnostic in, in early May, um, and, and uh, that link is, is uh, you know, leads to where that's available on the, on the website. Um, and then we we also followed up, uh, I Ryan, uh, with that um, with the adoption by by City Council of the uh, uh, guiding principles that were recommended um, in that code diagnostic document. Um, those were modified um, a, a little bit, but they were they were generally um, Adopted as as they were were recommended, um, and uh, and so that's been um, uh, we passed that point or milestone in the, in the project and have kind of set that that commitment to those principles. Um, also related to code reform uh, uh, internally, just you know for, for awareness, we um, within the, the city have. Um, uh, instituted and, and set up conversations to, to begin to work through, um, you know, these internal code misalignments that are being um, uh, identified through the code audit work that we've been engaged in so far. And that's to help prep for, um, for you know, when we're developing the, the code itself and being able to facilitate that and, and create efficiencies. On the growth policy update um, side of things, uh, we've been you know, focus primarily on on scenarios, scenario work, and developing scenarios for the future. Uh, we held housing options uh, workshops in in February and March. Um, uh, that that uh, where we heard um, input and and, and uh, uh, consideration from the community on related to um, housing housing options and expanding housing options in um, in our neighborhoods. Um, that um, uh, so that was in. Um, February March, we've been working along with that, and since then, to develop the the approach to um, creating these scenarios and to to uh, sharing them out. So that's that's what we want to run through with you today. Um, and then we've also um, developed our community profile materials um, draft, and that that link is also to where you can find that on the um, website. And and those are um, you know foundational to. Um, developing the land use plan and they inform um, scenario work and, and whatnot. We'll talk about that a little bit today too, but those are draft form and, and you know, we can, we expect to continue to hear um, input on that or, and, and we have, um, you know, the ability to modify those further as we bring those into the, to the uh, growth policy. And then finally, we, you know, we are working on drafting um, the new land use plan um, uh, um, as well. So uh, again, you know, a reminder that you can find information about the project um, at our project website, and that link is provided here. Is the land use plan the thing that assigns like types of different parts of the city? Yeah. Yes. That's that's how we're <laughs> thinking of it, and that, that's something we're going to talk about more here today, and kind of explain uh, explain some of that. What's the difference between the land use plan and the growth policy? Yeah, the land use plan is what. Um, <laughs> The, the growth policy is what we have now and what we call our plan and the land use plan is what it's called in the new land use planning act. So oh. we'll probably be transitioning from referring to the growth policy to the land use plan. Okay. Uh, we'll be explaining that more as we get closer to that too. Can you, um, do you think that's a good change of, of verbiage? Well, um, yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I, and I, I think that's that's something that we um, <clears throat> are. Let me follow up on that when we come to where we're going. Okay, that's right. Um, okay, so you know, this is a review of our time spent together um, with this group and what we focused on in our meetings. Um, I'm not going to walk through everything. Um, oh, two computers. Um, <laughs> No, I'm not going to walk through everything that's listed um, here, but um, 
but you know we like to provide this as a reference for you to, to know and, and, and have a reminder of how and when our conversations have occurred um, you know in relation to the materials that we're developing for the project and the conversations with the community that we're having around them uh, for today's meeting meeting number 13. Um, I'll, you know our point uh, I just want to point out that our um, focus is shifting you know away from the more code um, related side of the project towards policy um, and is not and so again this is an opportunity for us to catch up with you on the work around the scenarios um, that we're that we're doing and planning for and, and, and return to the future place types um, component and we'll be talking about those those things further as we move ahead um, over the summer um, and again just a reminder that you know these meetings are recorded and available um, the link at the bottom of the page is, is uh, where you can find the recorded meetings and then also a reminder that you know most communications we send out have a, our shared folder uh, for this group that's that's through teams and we try to put the materials um, related to this in that folder too if there's something you're looking for that's not in there you can always contact us and, or ask you know where it is or how to find it um, and so Next, we just want to jump to you know where we're going, um, and this is, uh, especially um, uh, related to you know the next the next few months, the and you know through the summer and into the fall. Um, on the code reform side, um, we have been um, internally working on um, establishing the, the approach to the code reform, um, and that's that's something that that's been a focus for us this this month. And as as that gets um, clarified, then that um, you know, sets us up to begin the, the code drafting work itself. And so that's something that we should be able to um, transition um, into um, to start to, to put that together and develop it um, as we're able, you know, probably within the next month. But the the actual full draft of that is something that we would anticipate um, being available for, for public review more, and, you know, towards the end of this year, probably November, December. <laughs> on the growth policy update side, um, we are planning for um, community open houses and community engagement around the scenarios in mid-July. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then, Bob, to go back to your question, um, you know, part of part of this project is affected by the new land use planning act. We call it the, the LUPA. And um, and that's where you know that bill uses that that name of a, a land use plan. Um, <clears throat> we are going to be um, circling back with with council uh, next you know mid mid July we think next month <clears throat> to um, provide you know some some more education about what's in that bill and and some some context and also some context about how we see it um, affecting this project and. Part of that discussion is uh, kind of a, a reframing of the role of the growth policy um, for the city of Missoula in regard to policy in general. Um, and we see it as an opportunity to, to really focus the growth policy on land use, um, the, the land use policy um, element, you know, specifically. Um, and so there is, you know, there's an opportunity here for a um, to help with, you know, clarifying and focusing how we understand our policies and implement our policies um, that it, you know we see as being opened up by this bill and that's something we want to um, bring forward to council and and, and relay to, to council as part of that um, presentation um, but it's also something that we are, are trying to kind of share out and and um, and uh, set that expectation you know as far as how the the new land use plan might look a little different than the current growth policy um, because of that so um, that's not something we had dedicated time for today, but it's certainly something that we can spend more time on in, in future um, discussions. Um, the question I keep getting uh, from this organization realtors, which I think you presented to them, the yeah. Um, building Industry Association is the, you know people outside uh, the general. I don't know the general public, but some of these organizations don't know how and when is their best. When should they focus on this to give input? Yeah. So I don't know. On the, the land use plan growth policy. Just code reform, reform in, general. in general. Okay. Yeah. But if that, I don't know if there's a, some public outreach of, like, I think we would like to see if you guys could present to MDIA, mm -hmm. um, but 
that's the confusion I keep hearing. Yeah. It's a big long process. Oh, yeah. Like, where it's not like move? one touch point, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I think we're hoping that this is starting to to um, um, specify and hone in on, on mm -hmm. those, um, especially those um, broader public enga engagement um, opportunities are. And so, you know, we're, we have one coming up soon next in, in the middle of July for the scenarios um, themselves and kind of what that tells us about what our preferred growth approach should, should be. Um, and then following on that, um, you know, we see and, and just getting there on here, but the, um, public engagement around the land use plan and, and, and it's the land use plan map. So the you know, future land use map, um, we're aiming to, to you know, um, focus the in the month of July on, on uh, um, hosting and, and facilitating you know that opportunity for for those discussions around around that um, with the community broadly. So that's that's where we're trying to you know, yeah put put people on notice and, and put it on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that would be more than the time. Yeah, and that's you know I've been having a similar conversation with folks. There's like there there are so many public opportunities for engagement in the project, and I just really want to be engaged when you guys are writing the code. So like, when is that time? And kind of my unfortunate response to them is don't wait till then because it might be too late, That's right? So right like right, everything is iterative and it's building on what we talk about through the scenarios for growth will help us define the preferred scenario, which leads us to what code do we need to, you know, make this growth pattern happen. And so I'm really encouraging people don't wait until you're like, okay, now we're getting into the code because so many things have informed how we would write that code that maybe your voice wasn't a part of. And so yeah, I've really been pushing people, you, re you really have to be engaged at all the levels. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And our, <laughs> one, of our, one of our sayings, slogans, mantras, uh, you know, is that, that the, the point that you, implement policy, it, sh it should be mechanical. Yeah. You know, we shouldn't be working through policy issues in writing the code. So that's that's the policy is the land use plan. Um, so that's a time to really kind of focus for um, trying to, to, to work through, you know, especially these values based questions and conversations and trade offs uh, uh, issues. And, and uh, so you don't want to wait till, to, till the code comes up to, to get okay. to things that are, you know, maybe more uh, values policy oriented. I've been a little nervous that we're not going to have enough time to actually like, review the things like the draft and use plan. So, but it sounds like we'll have at least a month, hopefully. Like it's not going to come out at the end of September and then the first week of October is when you're bringing it to council. Like that, that would be too yeah, much. Our, our, our goal yeah. is to provide a, 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 yeah, like a lengthy public <laughs> review process um, period. That's, that's our goal. Yeah, Bob. You just said, um, you know, at some point, it's not good. It's not good to be discussing the other thing. Can you give a, a solid example? Yeah. Of that? Um, like a setback. Okay. Like if you think, if you know, like a setback is like should be five feet or twenty feet. Like that's just a number. That's just execution of a of a goal. You know. And so, what is the goal? Well, the goal is kind of you know related to. Um, Different aspects of, of um, you know safety and character and, and um, uh, green space and, and kind of these, these different trade offs and, and that's that's the kind of thing that we're hoping to use the place type framework to to set um, and that's something we're going to be talking through here today. But and, and um, I think like diversity in housing types is another like we don't want to wait till we get to writing code to talk about whether or not a neighborhood should allow ADUs or duplexes and what we write into the code. We should have had that conversation at a policy level in terms of, you know, we think diversity of housing type should happen in all these kinds of neighborhoods in all these kinds of ways to help us achieve our housing goals. And then when we get to the code writing, we're just looking maybe at like specific technical aspects of that, not answering the question of is it is that something we support or not support, right? Sure. Uh, as of now, we've gone through all the kind of values and, uh, right? We're, well, we've, we will continue, we've got, we've identified the, the uh, values and um, that's, you know, 
part of what the scenarios are for are to measure, you know, impacts on those values based on different, you know, generally like the approaches to growth um, and then start to hone in on what that looks like. I think when, when we get to the, the scenarios for growth, you'll see how this conversation that we're teeing up for July helps us start to show the community ways that we could change and what that looks like visually. And that starts to get to some, especially around housing diversity and housing intensity, like what could this look like and what scenario for growth um, and how aggressive of, a, of scenarios for growth are we willing to look at for our community? So that's, a, that's the big values conversation that is we're teeing up. Yeah, and, and we want to, we think today is going to add some clarification and context around, around that too. Um, so just to keep things moving, yeah. So that's that. That's the goal is to have an adoption process. You know, really um, before Thanksgiving is is kind of our our goal here. I have to have an adopted land use plan. Um, so just you know, looking ahead, just one other thing um, for this group is that we want to schedule a, a special session, a working session, um, to help us uh, prep for these open houses related to the. Um, uh, scenarios um, and uh, so we, we're going to send out a, an invite to that um, uh, following this meeting but um, you know we we have open houses scheduled um, um, for um, uh, mid-july so you know um, they're they're an open house format they're drop in they'll be wednesday um, uh, uh, july 17th in the midday and, and the next week on a Tuesday in the, um, in the evening, we'll send out this, this uh, information, you know, the, the details on this, but um, they'll, and they'll both be at the library. Um, um, but we, we want to ask that, um, you know, that the members of this group, um, you know, attend and, and maybe even help to staff these events um, if you're able and interested. Um, and then um, we'd also just like to encourage and, and you know, kind of Push or challenge you to reach out to someone that you know that has not participated um, in one of these events yet, and, and to to bring them along, you know, and um, help us to to um, continue to to bring people into this uh, process. So that is um, that's our project update. Um, and we're going to pivot over to the business items. I, I was going to stop for questions here, but we've, we've had a, a few, and I think I might just keep pushing on and you know, we can save, save those um, more for the end. Um, so, you know, the, the next phase in the project involves identifying scenarios for future growth. Um, and, and the primary purpose of this is to identify and test different ways that Missoula can grow, basically. Um, and this is based on community feedback about what we learned from, you know, our phase two findings, um, including around the equity report, community analysis and code diagnostic, as well as the community profile findings um, related to growth policy update. Um, the focus of what we test for is to assess potential changes in land uses and understand its equity impacts, um, which applies to considerations for jobs, housing, sustainability, infrastructure, and transportation. Ultimately, we we want the, to use the scenarios to engage the community um, in understanding and weighing of, of trade-offs. Um, essentially, how do different growth patterns impact how current and future, you know, resilience live, work, and play? Um, and the feedback from the community um, on these will be used to design a preferred um, approach um, to these key policy issues. The preferred approach will attempt to balance multiple perspectives and concerns while making real progress on a more equitable, affordable, and sustainable future. And that approach is, you know, will be integrated into the revised growth policy and the, um, the new um, UDC. Um, so we want to walk through the general design of the scenarios um, uh, that, that we'll be producing. Um, as we've talked previously um, with this group about the projections, um, are, are we, you know, we've shown this, this data to you before about our population projection um, for um, that we've developed out of the um, community profile work. Um, and again, as a note, that that information and more details, need more detailed information is available on the on the website in the draft form now. 
Um, but at its most kind of fundamental level, our task here is to um, es uh, estimate the projected growth that we anticipate for Missoula and to plan for how to manage that growth. Um, our population projection estimates that we'll see almost 130,000 people living within the growth policy boundary area by 2045. Our housing needs assessment um, has identified that in order to meet that new population, we would need to produce a certain number of housing units somewhere in the you know low 20,000 um, units range. Um, but we are also operating um, and have been for some time at a very low uh, meet, which means unhealthy vacancy rate. So when we factor um, in for not only keeping pace with population growth, but also pulling our way back into a healthy vacancy rate, um, the housing need grows um, to the you know probably more more towards the upper 20,000 units range. So the scenarios will use that upper range of needed housing um, uh, as what we evaluate the impacts of the scenarios uh, too. Um, beyond what's in our current policies, we have additional guidance from um, analyses, you know, analyses that we've been going through the uh, our Missoula project. Um, you probably hopefully remember these principles from the equity and land use report that provide us with specific policy guidance um, and furthering equity through land use. And these are being factored into how we design the scenarios that we consider as well. Um, and then we have you know, put on several broad engagement cycles throughout the project to receive input from the community on the issues we're working through in this project. And those are um, listed here. Uh, um, and then along with and around those broader community of events and activities, we've also been holding successive public um, meetings over the time with City Council and Planning Board, which has been another venue for hearing and receiving community input. Um, and then as well in our efforts to ensure that engagement around this work is extensive and inclusive. We've been gathering input that's sometimes outside of a phase of the project, that's, but still important to hear and, and consider you know, outside of these designated engagement periods by trying to meet people where they where they are, and, and that's including through tabling, uh, attending stakeholder meetings, just having individual conversations and one-on-one -on -one, um, check-ins as, as we go along, um, holding office hours, receiving communications and whatnot. Um, and then, of course, this group is, is an important uh, touch point for us with the community. Um, so we invite, uh, we, we just want to continue to invite CAG members to share things with us you know, from, from the stakeholders and the constituents that you work with. So um, I'll have to say that the input we've been receiving throughout this project has been an important factor um, in, in putting this together as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, walk through our approach to the scenarios. Um, so you're going to walk through the methodology first and keep this pretty brief. If you have questions, um, you know, we can certainly dive into to things. Um, but for, for starters, there are several uh, inputs and assumptions um, that the scenarios are, are based on. Um, the developable lands inventory is an inventory of developable land that will be used for the modeling. The inventory excludes areas that are not developable due to physical or environmental constraints steep slopes, floodplain, that kind of thing. So we've, we've used this before um, in, in previous planning efforts as well. Um, second, the scenarios bring in the place type approach and as a way to bridge assumptions between our existing zoning and land use designations. And the place types are used to identify which development prototype um, to assign to a given parcel. Uh, the development prototypes are a model of a typical development that would be possible and likely under a given set of land use and market assumptions. So prototypes were developed generally for each zone district um, and in some, with some prototypes applying to multiple districts, um, different standards were you know, similar enough. And finally, the prototypes are synced with financial pro forma model to estimate the financial returns that could be expected if that prototype were developed. Are prototypes like buildings, like drawings of possible? They're they're happening? they're like the um, uh, factors for a build for a, a building, like the the fight, the okay. specs, I guess you, you could say. That makes sense. Like parking standards, open space. Yeah, to some to some degree. So they're, they're a set of assumptions for what the building, uh, what that project, that specific. It's a specific development project that's pegged to these different zoning districts. And the attempt was to 
find the high end, like the most intense development um, that, that could. So uh, like prototyping all the way up to like a mixed use commercial with no height restrictions or a fourplex residential or like those would be like. Yeah, there's, there's gradations. Like and, and we've gone through them um, previously. So in, in previous meetings here, we've kind of gone through what those look like. And um, so again, if you go back to that list, um, and I can do this after the meeting to kind of point point us towards where where we saw those. Uh, but we have kind of materials that we can look through on, on kind of what those those look like. Um, so the next kind of piece of the methodology is that the just to this is kind of an important piece of this to understand is that the foundational measure of the performance of each scenario is housing capacity. So these are just the primary input here is is to pour in housing capacity um, in different degrees and distributions um, around the city. So essentially, um, yeah, within that, there's two distinct measures of housing capacity that are proposed, um, and those are zoned capacity and market feasible capacity. And so these two measures work together to provide a more complete picture of what that housing potential is. Um, yeah. Are you saying more is better no matter what? Oh, you're not saying that, are you? So the 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 input is the capacity, and the output are the indicators. And we're going to look at what those are. So there are there are measurements that this this leads to, or, or we develop out of these that help us to evaluate uh, based on different policy goals. Is kind of the, the general approach here. Um, but just to say, you know, make make the point that. Um, you know, zone capacity is a measure of total theoretical capacity. Um, you know, it's it's useful for estimating the total amount of housing that could be potentially developed under assumed zoning scenarios, and, and we're using the existing zoning as kind of the the basis for this. Um, so that's in contrast to market feasible capacity, which is a measure that's more useful for predicting parcels that are more likely to develop um, under under the zoning scenario and given market constraints, which are kind of captured through these um, development prototypes. So that's like if there's if a lot is cheaper, it's more likely to be redeveloped, whereas like if it's more expensive or has a big nice house on it. Yeah, and if, you know, if yeah. there's there's a um, uh, relationship between, you know, the the profit that that you know related to what what is there now, mm -hmm. uh, and what would what would be taken? Yeah, it would take to redevelop. It's quite model well. It is. It's a it's a really um, interesting and helpful um, filter to this. Um, so we're going to move. So that's kind of the, the methodology in a nutshell. And um, and yeah, we can we can go back and talk about any of the, the details if we want to. Just to give you an idea of what the actual scenarios um, will include. Um, they're they're trying to capture them here. So, um, for starters, you know, just just to set it up, we'll be running four scenarios. Um, one of which is a baseline scenario. So that's based on our current existing conditions, 2023 conditions. Um, so this one is really for reference um, and not necessarily one that we're going to be sharing out publicly. But it's it gives us the ability to um, to um, compare to existing. Was like, what's that entail? Is that number of houses available versus demand or shortage of houses? Um, the zone capacity is what what's the capacity that our current zoning allows? Okay. And, the, and then the feasibility <clears throat> uh, uh, contrast to that. So again, you know, every scenario past that is going to add housing capacity to some degree. You have a chat. Yeah. Then, yeah, so there's a chat. Uh, Chris asked yeah. a question. Yeah, Chris is asking if we can point to any research or reference material that will inform the decision about how much is enough zoned capacity. Yeah, that's a great, great question and something that that we um, will be talking about. And I think I, I I think that probably the July 12th meeting is where one of the things that we'll want to dig into with this group. But um, the the concept here to share out, I think, is is that what 
what this helps to set up for us and a way to talk about this is um, um, uh, capacity to need, um, like a capacity to need ratio, basically. So we can show, you know, based on the projection, we know we need 20 something thousand um, units in this time, and we know that this zoning currently allows so many units. Um, it's going to be in relation to that that need, and so the need we have now is uh, and and um, and part of the conversation I think with you know around this is what level of comfort do we want to have for ensuring that we allow enough housing in order to actually see that housing occur. Um, and so, yeah, basically, the lower your, your capacity of need is, the, the, the smaller your aperture is for what actually can occur, the more you need to actually see that happen. Uh, so you're, you're making it, we kind of make it more or less hard on ourselves to actually see the, the, the needed housing that we, you know, are, are, have identified um, is there. Um, based on what the theoretical rules allow, um, you know, and, and then we can help evaluate the, the likeliness of what will actually occur. There are the capacity calculations that occur at each scenario level. Yeah. And obviously the university is part of this equation, just that demand on apartments and rentals. Yep. <clears throat> so you're saying we may need to have a zone capacity of like, 40,000 units in order to realize 25,000 units. Yeah. Or or even much higher than that. Yeah. yeah. It's not every block going to. I'll bet our zone capacity today would allow for 25,000 more units in the valley. Yeah, I, I think when we did our, our Missoula development guide last last uh, analysis of it, that was back in 2018, I think, was, was something like in the high 40s for, for zone capacity. So we, you know, and but but when we produced that that report, you know, the first response was like, well, that's not going to happen, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So um, that's that's the conversation I think, or part of the conversation that, that this kind of points to. Um, well, the capacity is there, but it's not being built. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's like looking it's at the capacity of... for multifamily commercial at unlimited densities in the. Brooks corridor area, but yet we have beach transportation. And we have, you know, so like there's there's some big disconnects in terms of what could be built, what exists there now, and how long we're looking out to any of that being developed. So yeah, that's why that zone capacity likely has to be much, much higher than what we're trying to achieve. Um, okay. So yeah, just to run through these the um, the, I'm going to give a brief description of, of what the, all, the alternate scenarios uh, we think will, will, would be. Um, the first, you know, usually when you do scenarios, uh, uh, you know, for like this, there's kind of an incremental aspect to it. Um, and for us, the kind of low increment um, would um, would be a modeling of what was required by the state recently in the last legislative session. So a um, you know, what, what would it look like? Um, what impact would it have if we just, you know, took that step and implement and, and you know, implement what, what was um, came out of the legislative session? And that, and that really kind of is focused on the impact of the, the duplex um, bill, um, the duplex and ADU bills. The next two scenarios um, are higher degree of change scenarios. Um, and they, they really both um, focus on an increased opportunity for new housing in all areas, um, you know, similar to as, as what we discussed and, and talked about in the missing middle housing options workshops earlier this year. The second scenario distributes housing opportunities similar as it is today relative to the current um, growth policy map. And so uh, as opposed to scenario three, um, which is focused more on kind of a reduction of disparities in housing opportunity across neighborhoods. Um, and so that, you know, that scenario is, is a, um, would be to, to contrast a kind of, um, a, a, a flattening out or, or what you could maybe call kind of a more, um, uh, 
disparities focused uh, scenario versus um, applying uh, higher capacity for growth uh, on the on the trajectory that we're on today. So it gives us a chance to kind of um, compare and contrast what the outcomes um, could be uh, between those two approaches. Both both of the second and third scenario also model changes. Um, they they take in assumed code changes that would allow for increased capacity in our mixed use areas as well. So that's our business and commercial, you know, downtown uh, districts like that. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm going to keep keep moving on um, just to round this out. Um, the final component of the um, of the um, you might have said it, but what's flu? Sorry, great question. Acronym. Sorry, my uh, apologies. The flume is the future land use map. That's what we call the the map, the land use map associated with the current growth policy. Um, okay, so the final component of the scenarios is that they'll produce metrics. Um, and Bob, this kind of goes back to your early, earlier question. And these are related to city policy goals to evaluate the differences between these different scenarios. Um, so these are the indicators related to capacity um, and affordability listed at the top here. So you know, we'll look at overall zone housing capacity, market feasible housing capacity, and then affordable housing options between you know effects on minimum sales price and rent and, and how that relates to the AMI needed to afford those prices. Um, look at equitable distribution of housing options and housing options, you know, capacity impacts on housing options in high opportunity areas. Um, and then we, we also have a, a set of indicators related to climate and connectivity, um, you know, specifically, and um, those look at a lot of those are more proximity based. So what what is the capacity change or that, you know, the, the implication for increase of housing capacity in proximity to these things like access to sustainable transportation options, access to transit, access to healthy food, commercial amenities and parks and recreation. Um, so the indicators are used to help set up conversations about trade offs um, to evaluate different growth, you know, these different growth strategies. And then the feedback from the community on these will be used to design a preferred approach to these key policy issues. The preferred approach will attempt to balance the multiple perspectives and concerns while making real progress on a more equitable, affordable, and sustainable future for Missoula, which we will be integrating into our update of the growth policy. Can, in the, yeah, in the climate and connectivity indicators, is that access to healthy food options, just access to a grocery store at minimum, or is it something more specific? So we included grocery stores and CSAs, farmers markets, and so just something more than gas station fast food. Yeah, food no, yeah. no gas station. Or, you know, yeah. <laughs> so that's typically like staff or WIC re mm -hmm. retailers. Um, staff is associated with gas stations. Mm -hmm. and during thirty cents, a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. Um. That was our our run through there the the approach. Um, so again, this is kind of meant to be high level and and you know gives to to give you a primer um, so that you you have a better understanding of what we're sharing out and what you what you'll be looking at again. We, we um, want to invite you and hope that you can help us to you know spend time with us um, in a couple of weeks to help kind of um, refine our our understanding of, of this these findings and kind of how we how we. Um, share this out and, and talk about it in the community. Um, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with that invite. Um, you can take a couple minutes for, for questions if there are any, um, and we'll move on to the next item. Yeah. How, uh, how granular are you going to get with the demographic changes and, and how that impacts the housing types? So like, are we going to see about 45,000 or whatever? Is that going to be 145,000? Is that going to be a lot of? Young families, couples, to your point about the community. Yeah. We won't ask. Be... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, do we have demographic information like that in the community profile? We do have demographic data like that in the community profile, but I don't, it's not going to be in the scenarios. So we're just going to talk about. We're not about... like right sizing prototypes or housing types for demographics. 
Yeah, we don't necessarily want to say like this uh, area is primed for renters or like getting that spread evenly throughout the city is equity based, right? We don't want to have like a neighborhood that's primarily just renters and a neighborhood that's primarily homeowners because that gives undue power in some areas. So, it is a good question though, because like if it's going to be a retirement community that requires different, like different housing, then like, like smaller households, right? Like young couples with one kid or whatever. Yeah, I, I think this, I mean, I, I would say this gets into kind of a question of what is, where do we want to be prescriptive versus where do we want to get out of our way? And, well, and a lot of, well, in the role of regulation, right? The role of regulation or regulatory environment should be to provide an option in every neighborhood for a diversity of home types. And then the market can come in and look at there's this huge demand for smaller scale, you know, more retirement type condos, HO, like different types of units. And, and then we have, we have primed the market to react to that by allowing those types across the community in different neighborhoods. Um, I, and I, I agree with Aaron on that. It's the housing variety and types. You can't normally dictate. There's a few exceptions to that. Who's going to build what and where. But the housing variety provides different scale and different types. And for a healthy community, you need a vast variety of types. So there's a natural cycle that will happen if we have enough homes of different types to downsize first time home buyers and all of those pieces. So I agree with the regulation does so many things and then the market will react uh, for the opportunity. I think there's there's kind of a framework that that has been helpful for us talking about to, to regulations and approach to this update um, that I think would be helpful to, to kind of know and, and know that we're talking about and as a way to think about this moving forward, which is, you know, really that the there's there's kind of different tiers of implications for um, for how we address these things within the regulations. Um, and the easiest kind of lowest tier is to just scrub or remove the impediments to, to what you want to see happen. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of what we've been focused on and that the code diagnostic especially is focused on is where are we creating a barrier to something that we have already identified we want to, to allow? Um, and, and so that's kind of the lowest hanging fruit and also the, um, um, the, 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 the lightest lift. And then, but there are you know, other tools that, that we could use and, and consider that kind of the next level up could, is generally around what, what incentives do we would you want to offer you know to, to try to guide development or guide outcomes um but that's more complicated and um and, and requires kind of um you know more complex in some degree and, and sometimes requires more resources and then the, the third kind of heavy the, the the heaviest lift or the third tier is is where you you know think about um requiring outright you know and that that can be um um a heavier lift, you know, again. So that's, that's one way that we're thinking about this as we. So the civil engineer and me can't help mm -hmm. but ask this question that we <clears throat> didn't envision all this density on paper, but is the infrastructure there? Sewer and water in particular, like we're struggling with some projects on the west side of the reserve, like right off the reserve, and there's no water over there. There's no fire protection. That's a huge barrier to the development, redevelopment of some of those lots on the Missouri Street corridor. Both and some on the eat like the living room, they're hurting for fire protection. So that's kind of would limit that building redeveloping for some reason. Yeah. But I don't know if that's yeah this con yeah. Sorry guys. Um we had that conversation when the county was addressing their zoning and that we really need to interlace infrastructure planning with the land use and then um, zoning as well. So I hope they're engaged in the process. I agree with you. Sorry, Ryan. And there's the examples on expressway that we've been looking at and also North Reserve um, and there's the bottlenecks in the sewer. So yeah. there's Great. a point the developer wants to do X number of units, but 
there's a million dollars with upgrades that need to happen. <clears throat> so I don't know. It's 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 a real issue. Yeah. yeah. Layering, I think layering the broader infrastructure discussion with with um, place types and you know the eventual preferred scenario and how we move ahead with code reform is key. And then even at a more minute level, you know, we're we're talking a lot about even just what happens in the you know more urban infill area around right of way and kind of the battle between utilities <laughs> and street trees and you know the, the needs that fire has and land use. and so we're really trying to resolve those conflicts as part of the process so it's it, we're not into a place where we're funneling a lot of these dueling values into a unified development code, but we've resolved those conflicts before we have ever could import those into unified development code. And so yeah, infrastructure both at that high level of are we realistically identifying higher intensities or homes in places where there's infrastructure that can just support them, which are big conversations that are happening around the Y right now, and in parcels like those off West Reserve. And then even at a more urban infill level, where we do have those utilities, how are we balancing, or we do have those services, how are we balancing all of our needs within that, so. There is a question from Chris. He raised his hand. Thanks, Lino. Go for it, Chris, and then we're gonna um, have to keep moving on to, um, uh, keep on track. Yeah, I'm just, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, it might be a sort of an overly simplistic view, but in general, don't you have a better ability to uh, build and maintain infrastructure if you have more homes on a given mile of pipe? Um, I, I, I get that we are going to need to uh, upgrade the existing infrastructure and build new, but doesn't that become easier if we have a lot more people paying in? Well, I would say yes and no. I, I mean, don't think so because we're, it's an upfront cost. It's an upfront cost, and we are we're looking at creative ways to approach that though, and we've done that in the build grant area of you know delayed yeah. or deferred improvement agreements where people can buy in as they come into the district and build. So it's not just one huge upfront cost by first first developer in, um, and so we are we're trying to get creative about how to how we approach that because at a base level the way that it's structured it is kind of first developer in um and and then future developers or homeowners get to benefit from that infrastructure but don't necessarily pay into it and so there are some ways that we're trying to approach that differently to help even that playing field and kind of create that shared cost which does make it more reasonable i mean we just the argument doesn't seem to hold that you're creating more units in a larger tax base because I don't think that tax base goes to infrastructure necessarily, unless there's an impact fee like in the mall and build area. Yeah. That's true. <clears throat> yeah. Interesting. It just kind of covers fire, police, maintenance of roads, that type of thing. The yeah. city government getting bigger to accommodate the growth. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. This is all good, good stuff. Um, I want to, I, I do want to um, take a chance to um, catch up with this group and, and pick back up um, generally where we left off in our, you know, previous conversations around place types um, and to um, catch, catch up with, with some of the things that uh, we've been working on and, and talking about. Um, so first, as, as a reminder, the, the place type framework basically describes the variety of places that comprise Missoula today based on um, kind of this updated formula moving from just a land use description, which you know often includes density, to um, um, distinguishing from each other, or, you know, dist distinguishing different places from each other based on land use and intensity as well as community form and as well as um, mobility um, related um, considerations. Um, so this is a chance um, to expand from our current approach to describing um, and designating you know preferred land uses, adding in consideration of a form of mobility and, and 
a way to look beyond just density um, and provides a more holistic approach to talking about land use. Um, when we discussed this last year, we've been focusing on developing an initial menu of existing place types uh, based on what we had observed so far in our, you know, that, that um, phase two uh, community form analysis work, um, as well as evaluation of our, of our policies. Um, and so our original menu, you know, is shown on the left here um, and, and included um, kind of this um, um, fairly basic menu of a, a you know, a downtown, um, a couple of, of mixed use and commercial place place types, kind of a transect approach to residential place types that, that move from urban to suburban to rural, um, calling out industrial and employment um, areas and then special purpose. And um, since then, you know, based on findings and, and engagement and, and input, um, you know, the, we've had a chance to drill down on this more and, into what makes these areas unique and, and special and identified, you know, this expanded um, suite of future place types um, that we, we think we would want to work with. Um, to um, incorporate as we as we move forward in the, uh, developing the land use plan, so the um, you know the, the different place type names are shown here in red, and we want to spend some time now just to kind of talk through how we got to this and, and where where this came from and what the implications are. Just the one experience or takeaway I've had from Mr. Tuckey, yeah, the thought to consider I think moving forward is what we found with the transects is you'll have a developer that specializes in single family homes, town homes, stick frame buildings, but then there's a requirement for a commercial transect mm -hmm. and a requirement for multifamily transect, and that stops giving developers pause when they have a niche to have to be now an expert in those other areas that they may not be, mm -hmm. or they have to team with other developers to tackle a project like that because they don't want to deal with the commercial component or the multifamily component. So it's a requirement to have all three transects unless you're under five acres in Sutup Cane. And it's it's been challenging for yeah. local developers especially to get their head wrapped around. Yeah. That's a good that's a good comment for us and, and good to hear. I, I think you know hopefully that might be a unique issue to Sutup Cane um, because that is a great, you know, it's it's a Greenfield site that, you know, so that being built in kind of this next layer of planning um, as part of the, the development process, um, which again is, is kind of a unique issue, I think, issue within that um, that area, as opposed to how this might kind of work or be implemented um, in other areas of the, the city. Um, but so that game is certainly, you know, something we've been talking about and thinking about as we as we're working on the Developing the code approach and kind of how, you know what what the code update looks like and how does sort of game fit into all of that. Um, so we'll be able to have more more to, more on that um, soon too. Um, so the you know just to explain the, the place types approach provides benefits that that lend themselves both towards our planning and our code reform efforts. So I, you know this kind of goes to this too, Ryan, but. Um, you know, for planning, you, we see it as helpful because it, it's just a, a simple, clearer way to, to work through and talk about land use issues. Um, and, you know, it's, it's graphically oriented for one thing, and, and some you could say a picture can tell a thousand words, but um, there's kind of a, a more accessible component to how, how to um, uh, look at these and think through these things. And then we also see it as, as transparent and hopefully a way that we can build trust with people. Um, to see where we are now and where we think we're going in these different places. Um, but it's also, you know, useful for coding and, and it's going to play, you know, there, there's a there's a link here between this work on the planning side and where it points to on the coding side. Um, you know, so I just want to plant that seed here that as we're talking about this, we're, we're focused really on it as a planning uh, in relation to, to planning, because that's kind of where we are now. But um, this is um, a way to organize and, and inform the code update as, as well. So um, that's something we, we, we just want to be tracking. Um, so to explain this more, we're going to walk through a progression of how this approach fits together. Um, and you know, the starting point is, is land use, and the slide is going to get built out a little bit as, as we go here. Um, but the uh, 
Um, so, you know, the, to start with the, the growth policy is our current land use policy foundation. And as part of that, the, you know, the future land use map, the FLUM, as we talk about, this is the FLUM. The FLUM is, um, you know, a key component of the growth policy. Uh, the land use map is the geographic application of the growth policy to places, to different areas in the, in the city. Um, with a typical land use approach, generally um, there's a combination of, of a basic land use designation narrative description, and then this 2D you know, map indicating preferred land uses and, and, and densities. Um, and what you see often is that these descriptions tend to get loaded up over time uh, as concerns over community character, integration with transportation and mobility concerns, placemaking, you know, character, um, um, and, and what and, and, and whatnot have become more, you know, common to um, work through by updating these descriptions. And so you, you often end up with land use designations that become more lengthy and, and elaborate. Um, and so this isn't an issue that's unique to Missoula, but we certainly, you know, we see that that here. Um, um, sometimes the, the 2D map um, and table of land, des um, land use designations are not adequate in capturing nuances. Um, so for this example, we're gonna focus on our residential medium uh, designation, which is, you know, it's mapped pretty broadly um, throughout the city. Um, and you're seeing again, we have the same land use, but, um, but different contexts. So, you know, this residential medium includes both this, um, more urban neighborhood, um, uh, kind of place and as well as, uh, other more suburban, uh, neighborhoods. And, um, so this is showing, you know, the distinction say between the university district and the far east Patty Canyon neighborhoods. Um, so as an example of where the. Preferred use is similar, but the form and context is, is totally different. So, and, and this can be challenging in implementation, uh, like for example, in rezonings, uh, because the community and, and staff can have different um, interpretations of what the intent is. Um, so to sum up, um, this is a representation of the application of a land use designation as it's used today. Um, so in our current growth policy. So we're going to continue to build this um, uh, this out. Uh, and so the next element here we're going to consider is community form. Um, and we've looked at this before, but it's a helpful reminder. Um, you know, community form refers to the various ways that streets, blocks, lots, buildings, green space um, are organized into distinct patterns of development. And the way neighborhoods and places around the city look, feel, and function depend on how these physical elements um, are designed and arranged. And just to point out that part of that is that you know that each of these has its own degree of variability. Um, so we can help understand the form of a place by breaking it out between the urban and the built form. Um, urban form is primarily focused on streets, blocks, and lots, and the relationship and variability between those elements, uh, preferences for method of travel, you know, and modal priorities relates quite a bit to this. Streets are designed to facilitate travel, um, connecting places to to, an, to one another. So there's a close relationship between um, land use and built built form there. Um, the urban form also, you know, helps describe our green spaces, including <coughs> parks and plazas that are human made as well as natural um, and open spaces as well. So the next layer of community form beyond that, beyond urban form is considering for built form, uh, how do buildings and structures factor in? What's the scale of the building? What are they used for? How do they relate to one another um, and uh, relate to the urban form, right? So act, you know, adding in consideration of form helps to inform us and, and tell us what the context is for, for places and um, the context of and help inform us on the context of how Missoula has grown and what development patterns are uh, as have occurred as growth as uh, growth has um, occurred. So, you know, another way to think of this approach is essentially we analyze the past to understand and explain the present so that we can look ahead and, and better and be better informed to shape the future. And for Missoula, that community form analysis has pointed to several, you know, distinct period periods of development with different 
associated development patterns that are kind of indicated here. Um, and, and then, you know, especially as they relate to the prevalent mode of transportation at the time of development. Um, Missoula's residential neighborhoods are reflections of the time period when they developed and are typically, you know, we see differences between urban, suburban, and rural contexts, uh, which are distinct areas characterized by the unique combination of these streets, blocks, and lots as presented here. And, you know, this distinction between that some of those are highly walkable and some of those are, you know, much more auto oriented. Um, and this, you know, this has relevance to our efforts related to reforming our codes. You know, as we pointed out in the code diagnostic, current zoning standards are not calibrated based on the existing context and historical patterns. So this makes it difficult to build compatible infill development, um, which adds complexity um, to that, you know, to, to be able to do that and uncertainty. So to continue building out this kind of the, the model. Um, first, we add an urban form, you know, to, to our land use and, and account for um, the um, streets, lots, and blocks, green space. Um, and then on top of that, we add in the built form in consideration of the built form. Um, the next piece of this is that uh, accounting for aspects of mobility. You know, how are people traveling to, from, and through a place? What are the modal priorities for that place? Um, what are the considerations related to walking, rolling, and riding? And where does this place land on a spectrum of, you know, between more or less auto-oriented or pedestrian-oriented? Um, so land use plus form plus mobility. Um, in the, I gotta help myself. Um, so finally, this, the, the framework allows us to evaluate development related implications um, relative to intensity. That's kind of the final component here, um, which allows us to think about and talk about and understand what is the associated degree of change um, that we would expect to consider um, within as we start thinking about designating and uh, uh, um, assigning, you know, um, what type of place you know we expect um, this to, to go into? Um, so this um, is to represent you know a it, do we do we see this maintaining a level of change of the traditional um, uh, or or kind of status quo degree of change um, or you know is it something that's more evolutionary? So I'm gonna just go back and forth between these because I like to see the change so this can again this is kind of a, a way to you know evaluate and and account for what are what are the considerations for if we um uh do think this is going to transform more well that brings up questions about infrastructure that brings up questions about resources so another factor here um okay uh, i want to take a little time to talk through with you um um what this brings up related to mapping is just tracking time. I think I've got about five more minutes of, of this and then we can um, uh, preserve some time for more, more conversation around this. Um, so related to mapping, this is where we start to circle back to how this is incorporated into our approach um, to developing scenarios. Um, as we described earlier, the scenarios uh, bring in the place type approach as a way to bridge you know, assumptions between our existing zoning and land use designations. Um, and I uh, just want to walk through that a little bit. Um, you know, our starting point with mapping place types um, is the current land use designation of the growth policy, the, the FLUM. And then the next factor is, is an analysis of our existing block patterns um, that was conducted as part of the community form analysis. So um, this is a Distinguishing between, you know, patterns between compact gridded streets, curvilinear streets, um, uh, predominance of streets ending in cul-de-sacs, um, or more rural kind of super grid um, patterned areas or, or other other patterns. Um, so on top of this, we also want to take into consideration where and what type of commercial corridors um, we've you know, indicated and, and recognized. So we overlay these geographies. Um, Together, and that's our starting point for how we we can consider, you know, 
this place type approach from a mapping um, aspect. Um, you know, the formula for that is presented here as a crosswalk um, to describe how we arrived at, at our, you know, this updated menu of future place types. Um, and as it relates to the scenarios, uh, I won't, I'm not going to walk through all of these. Um, but it's here for your reference you know, with this presentation. Um, and uh, but you can't read that all. Yeah, I wonder if I can. It's very small. Uh, yeah, um, basically, you know, um, this is a this is a resource for for us and helps to explain some of this thinking. Um, and just you know to say that the for the scenarios the way this works is that the scenarios is a static uh, or the place types um, it layers a static layer geographically uh, meaning that the boundaries you know um, apply to the scenarios and the location of the place types don't or won't change. Um, or shift with the different scenarios, but the assumptions associated with some of these place types are, are, are do shift uh, between different scenarios, and that, that leads to different um, considerations. Um, we want to give some indication of where this could go beyond the scenarios, um, which is, you know, we going back to your, your question, Brittany, you know, we, we see this as a way to update and reorganize the land use designations um, component of the growth policy. Um, so I'm going to share some mockups here of how this could be incorporated, and you know we'd like you to be thinking of this as a and, and to see this as a, a preview of what we want to um, of what we're thinking about. But we also want to return uh, to talk more about this with you and, and give it some more focus. But um, and you know just as a note disclaimer, um, this is very rough draft and preliminary um, representation of where we are with this. So don't read too much into what you're seeing here as far as the specifics or content or format. Um, this is just to give a sense of, of where we think this could go. Um, so I'm going to just give an example between the you know urban residential high place type um, versus um, say a, a, a suburban residential. So as a summary, you know we can kind of name that these are areas intended to provide a high diversity of housing and building types that provide dense population centers and robust opportunities for both rental and home ownership opportunities. Anticipated densities enable small commercial services with the, with the area that it was intended to provide residential support service to local residents. So, call you know name and call out that the, there could be commercial um, uh, opportunities here. Um, we can call out that we expect this to be a, a compact gridded um, uh, urban uh, form pattern, uh, and that that should direct kind of development. Um, uh, considerations we can call out that we expect the, a variety of housing um, types and building types. Um, you know, and versus in comparison, something you know more related to potentially what a suburban residential place type um, might look like. These are areas that are intended to provide a mixture of housing types that are aimed more specifically at enabling home ownership opportunities on larger lots. The intensity of development in these areas don't promote compact and walkable distances between residential housing and everyday locations, um, such as you, you might look for as, as kind of your, your go to walkable amenities, uh, grocery stores, schools, commercial services. We can call out that the development pattern is more, you know, probably more um, supportive of cold, uh, you know, development using cold sacks or less connected uh, development patterns and, and associated building types. Um, Wait, I have a question. Yeah. So is this saying that like, so like suburban residential areas can't accommodate things like a grocery store. Like, like, how do you evolve a suburb? Like, well, that's just that, stuck in time. You know. Well, it helps us to to um, make that a planning decision mm -hmm. versus just a kind of. Uh, un, yeah, I I think you know that that brings up a degree of change consideration. Okay. You know what what are the associations or considerations to convert something that's built out in a suburban, um, you know pattern that has those considerations. It's not very walkable. Things are farther apart from one another. The, the, the infrastructure is different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what? Like that, how would the infrastructure need to evolve? How would densities increase to a level to bring in and warrant commercial services? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's also a, a way to have that conversation. Maybe mm -hmm. everybody thinks, why, why wouldn't we have or allow for grocery stores in any place type or and um or does it you know it 
So we can triangulate between these considerations and not just the use, but also what the form is and what the mobility considerations are um, and kind of what amount of change that, that you know, means for that place um, mm -hmm. to have that conversation rather than just kind of put you on its face that use. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, I'll just run through, you know, these are this is just to indicate kind of additional components that this could include and that we're thinking about that, you know, again, breaking out between land use, you know, primary uses, residential intensity, economic considerations, um, you know, that, that we can start to, to name kind of what are the use um, characteristics or considerations specific to that place type. Um, community forum, you know, block pattern and, and whatnot, but also street trees maybe or green space. Um, getting into build form, you know, looking at, at housing diversity, um, but other other building scale consider um, or characteristics like height and, um, and, and setback. Um, and then, you know, the mobility piece um, that helps to um, clarify what are the modal priorities, you know, based on place type of approach and what are the implications that has for um, for development there. So um, sped up there at the at the end, uh, but I did, did just want to save time for um, for any questions and comments before we break up here. Yeah, Bob. One comment is I thought a lot about the grid system for a long time and um, I don't think uh, in my opinion we should equate grid walkable non-grid, non-walkable. You can have a curvilinear system and you can have a lot of high degree of connections. You can redevelop it. You can connect cul-de-sacs with a, a path. So I just want to make sure we're not like, hey, you know, there's no right angles in nature. And I, I've read a lot about why we have right angles in this, this grid system in our cities. And there's some there's some benefits to it. There are also some disbenefits to it. Um, like new building, you, if you just grid it out, you don't pay attention as much to the, the form of the land and the way the rivers flow and you're kind of imposing. So I just want to make sure going forward, we might hold some space for a non-grid and still work towards highly walkable and people oriented with higher density. Do you have any reaction to that? I do, but does anyone else? Um, yeah, I know that one, sir. I think of grid as small block form, not necessarily grid. So maybe it's a name change. It's the way that it's implemented, at least yeah. in the cities I've, I've worked in. Um, yeah, I don't see grid very much anymore, but I see small block form. Yeah. yeah. That might be one of the key of kind of what I'm thinking about. Yeah, because it can, it can adapt to wherever, and it's how you develop out a curvilinear or, yeah, like if the, you know, the, any one of our canyon neighborhoods was to develop further, that's how you do it, right? Um, after infrastructure considerations. I don't I don't love the description of suburban. I feel it's like that's past. yeah, I don't I don't, I don't it's really it's not affordable it anymore. anymore. It sounds incredible. Yeah, and, and building myself building, you know, we're 300 homes up with the cane. I'm wondering if we're rural or if we're urban or if we're because we're half of our units are required to be 5500 square foot lots detached housing yeah so that's suburban but we're you know i wonder if we're going to be the only project out in this neighborhood well i think i think again this so duck gain area is, is a little bit of a unique yes yeah. you know unique situation because it is like a, a greenfield neighborhood you know it, it is yeah. a master planned area that um so let me say it a different way that whole that uh, growing to the west and there was talk about the county mm -hmm. like do we call that suburban and if right. we do because that's what i would think of like it's out of town that we're talking about in the description that was just there i mean i don't think that's a good idea i think we need i think we need another term well like, would it be a, a different um i guess my question would be whether you see it as a a different um, description of that type of place or or that it would be a different place uh, like rural or, or i mean do, do you see it as a different characteristic than uh, I, guess, I guess i'm thinking about developing new land rather than redevelopment and as we build and adopt and take in new land on the on the you know uh, the dynamics of the city are we calling it 
suburban or are we calling it urban? And if it's on the fringe and it's being taken in, it, it could typically be called, you know, suburban. And I don't think it should be developed in the way that we're talking about there. Like you look at the growth boundary that Oregon uses just as an example. And as they take in new land and the plants that come in for it, like it's it's, it's highly dense. Yeah, well, that's a mix, but there, but it's it would be in our definitions for you know, more urban. Mm -hmm. It has the commercial components and the the daycare and the grocery and trying to avoid food deserts and all the rest. It's just food for thought. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Any other reactions to that or, or comments or questions? I, I see the future of Missoula. I think it's it's more like all neighborhoods or self-contained communities. So yeah, maybe maybe that's kind of what you're saying, Justin. Is, well, where your El Pass Reserve, that really should I think should be its own. Yeah, place not dependent on downtown Missoula. Mm -hmm. miles away or whatever. Yeah. Self-contained, five-minute walkable neighborhood. And that takes a while to do. Or, <laughs> you, the best place that I find organically growing over some of centuries. So we're in, thank you for uh, <laughs> taking the it's about doing the hard work because it, it may not pan out for a while. And I don't know how you to make it work uh, if it's a long view. Uh, Chris, did, did you have a? Oh, sorry, about that. that's our time. I I know we're we're out of time, but I guess my my hope would be to piggyback on Brittany's comment is that like when we're talking about any of these place types and when we're talking about block styles, we are constantly thinking about the future, not thinking about it getting built out to its permanent state, and that it has an ability to evolve over time. And I think that's why the grid has stood up over time because it is just the simplest way to do things, not that it's the only way to do things. And so if we're gonna start talking about taking suburban forms and, and, and how do they eventually turn in 50 or 100 years into a, an urban walkable place, like that's the point, is it not? I think the point is to be able to make it, um, uh, informed intentional decisions for the places that are built out so far for how to how to um, support that or facilitate it um, so that's that's my impression of how this this can can help us is is to help focus and you know given that what you're seeing that what we're talking about is change over a long a long time um, that there's this presents an opportunity to um, guide that and, and do it in a way that's targeted and uh, informed and intentional and, and um, effective. Um, um, that's a little a little bit of a, a different approach from, from maybe how we have, have done things in the past. But this is great input, and we 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 need to you know kind of. Um, take it in and, and be thinking about it. And, and like I said, this is something that we're hoping to continue to talk about with this group. So thanks for, for sharing. And um, I'm going to call the meeting to order and then the recording. And I'm happy to, to stick around and be talking to those of you in the room, too. I have an announcement that doesn't need to be in the part of the meeting, but Pro Housing Missoula has two more. We've been doing these like meet at a park and do a little walking tour of the neighborhood nearby and look at looking at. Um, like interesting developments or like developments that would be illegal to rebuild today. And we have two more. They're July 31st at McCormick Park and then um, August 20th at Bonner. And they're six to eight. It would be legal or illegal still today. Or we're, we mostly are looking at like interesting things that happen, like little cottage courts or um, like interesting dense development developments that that would be illegal like if they if they burn down today to rebuild and the goal is just to like help build like community knowledge around zoning and so um yeah it's been really fun and I, like ashley's britner wells has been sending them and we'd love to see folks at the last two if you're interested Did you say six to eight on 31st of the corner yep yeah please come it's, it's been really fun yeah Thanks, Brittany. Yeah. And you guys are welcome, too.